Using shaders, we can manipulate the geometry of objects to get some really cool effects. In this video, you're going to learn some basic operations to apply to vertices to get some cool effects like moving the entire object or a breathing effect. Hey, Chris here from Lom Academy, here to help you. Me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by diving into vertex manipulations in Shader Graph. I think it's important to understand the basics of what we're talking about with vertex manipulations before we start getting into more complicated things like wind on a cape. And while these are simple and you might be tempted to use something like a tweening library or an animator to get the same outcome, this lays down the foundation that we'll build on in some future videos to do things like putting waves on a plane, or moving a cape with wind, or trees with wind. I know I've personally used the animator a bunch of times to get these exact same effects, but it's really cool to see them working in a shader. We'll start off by creating our shader graph by going to Create, Shader Graph, URP Lit Shader. I'll just name it Vertex Displacement because we're going to play with some different options on how we can do vertex displacement. If we double click that, that opens up our Shader Graph node editor. Up here at the top left, we have the ability to create input parameters. At the top right, we can adjust the settings of the shader. You might not have those. We have Blackboard and Graph Inspector in case those don't show up for you right now. We're not going to change any settings in the Graph Inspector, so I'll click this button to get rid of it. Over here on the right, we have two different sections, Vertex and Fragment. You can see in the fragment, that's where we're going to set up base color, normals, metallics, smoothness, emissions, and ambient occlusion. Today, we're only going to apply the base color. You can apply the same processes to allow you to input different textures for the normals, metallics, and all this other stuff. The vertex is the interesting one for us today. We're going to be playing with the positions specifically and manipulating the positions of each vertex. How the shader works is for every vertex on our target object, it's going to execute whatever code gets generated by this shader graph. Pretty important distinction that we only know about the specific vertex that we're dealing with at a given time, and I'll get into why that's important in a little bit. Because we want our shader to be able to represent a texture, let's add a base map and a base color property. The base map will be a texture 2D. I like to name them in this way because it allows us to very easily retain our textures that we assigned when we we're coming over from a different shader using the same naming convention. For example, the default URP lit shader, or all of the default URP shaders, call the base texture the base map. And for the base color, we'll make that a color. We can just drag that base map into our node graph drag over on this little red dot into the empty space. It'll ask me what node do I want to connect to. We'll say a sample texture 2D, and now we can see the sample texture 2D node. We're going to also drag the color, and on that output, we're going to drag into a multiply node, drag the RGBA of the sample texture 2D to the multiply, and then the multiply out to the base color. It looks a little bit weird with this being black, so we'll open up that graph inspector again, select our base color, and give a default color of white. Now we can use basically the same workflow that we're accustomed to by assigning a texture and some color to this material that uses a shader. You'll see this sphere, cube, and cone thing already have a testing material using the universal render pipeline lit shader. I'll change them over to using the shader graphs for text displacement, which is the shader we just created. We see the base color works basically as we expect it to do. Cool. We'll go back to the shader and let's start making it do something. Something we frequently use the animator for, that we could use a shader for instead, is to have an object move back and forth. I'll press space to get prompted for creating a node, and I'll search for time. We want this thing to move automatically on its own, so the time is exactly what we need. We'll drag that into the empty and create a multiply node, set it to go into the A property, and I'll press space again, get prompted for which node do I want, and say position. I'll change the space to object space and drag that to the multiply B. You can see in the preview that it's moving over time back and forth. Perfect. And connect the out of the multiply to the position. Let's see how does that look. So that didn't move our object, instead it's like scaling it up and down. Why does that happen? Over here, we have multiple space options for the position. And remember that this is calculated for every vertex on our object. So every vertex, what we're doing is multiplying its current position by a value from negative one to one. So that makes kind of sense that it would go down to be completely invisible, become inside out, and then go back to its original state. Probably instead, we want to just add the position to our current position. That looks much better. We're getting it to move around. But this shader isn't very customizable because now all of our objects will only move this way. We can't change the direction or how fast they do this. If we want to do that, let's create some new inputs. Make a vector 3 movement direction. And we'll multiply the movement direction by the sine time 
and then add the result of that into our object's current position. If we set the default value for movement direction to be 1 on the x, we would expect it to only move on the x-axis. Cool. And if we set the value to be more than 1, it'll move farther along on the x-axis. What about speed though? All of these will always move at the exact same speed. Instead of using sine time, what we can do is multiply the time by some speed value and then input that into the sine function. The reason that we get this kind of back and forth movement is any value you ever pass into the sine function will always give you a value between negative one and one. That's some trigonometry you maybe forgot about in your math classes. I'll set the speed to be one by default, and then let's take a look at how it looks. Right now, it looks the exact same as we saw before, which is expected, but we can now increase the speed. Cool. We can also change the direction, and they start moving in all kinds of different directions. Great. Just for fun, let's take a look at the space. We have object view, world, tangent, absolute world. In most cases, if we're trying to manipulate a particular object, we're going to want to use the object space because we want to move it relative to itself, but potentially you might want to move something around in the world. That doesn't exactly give you the result we want unless we're actually at the origin. Why is that? Because we're taking the vertex position in world space and moving it around some based on the time and movement direction. We really want to move the object relative to where it currently is. You can kind of think of this as the same as using the local position and the position properties on a transform. Let's leave this shader alone and create a new one where we can play around with a little bit different options. Instead of creating a new one from scratch, I'm going to save this vertex displacement as and save it as vertex displacement 2. That's a cool trick if you want to keep your shader or use it as a base for a new shader. Let's remove the movement direction. We'll keep our time multiplied by speed into a sine function and then let's multiply by the normal. That's under input geometry normal vector. Again, because we're dealing with a particular object, we want to use the object space normal vector. We'll then add in this multiplied amount to our current object's position and map that back to the vertex position outputs. And a normal is just a vector pointing out from the face of this plane. We'll change our shader to this new vertex displacement and we'll see we get a very similar result to what we had before, except now you can see on like the box, it's not just scaling up and down. We're actually moving the faces of this box based on the normal direction. So we're not just scaling it up and down. The sphere looks more or less the same as we saw before, but as we get different input geometry, it looks a little bit different. You can see when we have hard angles, we get detachments to the bottom of the cone and all the sides of the cube. We end up with holes in the mesh because we have hard normals like that, the mesh doesn't stay together properly. So that's something to consider if you're doing vertex displacement based on normal directions. Really hard angles don't end up showing up very well, or you can end up with holes like that. If we only wanted an object to like grow slightly bigger, how could we modify this to prevent it from going like backwards? Well, remember that sine gives us a value from negative one to one, and we're multiplying by a normal vector. So really anything that's negative, we want to get rid of. Anything positive, we want to keep there. There's this cool node called remap, which defaults to exactly what we want. We want the in minimum maximum, which is negative one to one for sine. So we're saying that's what we're expecting to get in. We want to remap that out to be from zero to one. Perfect. We'll put that into the multiply node A, multiply by that normal vector, and see what happens. Cool. Now they go back to the base scale, scale up, and then back down. This is how you can get like a cool breathing effect on some objects. If you want to adjust the amount that it moves, we can add in a new input. We'll call it grow amount and set the default to be one. We'll drag that into our graph, drag the output to a multiply node, and multiply it by the output of that normal vector times the remap. In our scene right now, it looks the same, but we can increase the grow amount to two. Everything gets much bigger. And of course we can still play with the speed. So you can get a nice little subtle movement here. It's important to note that when we're doing vertex manipulation like this, the base object position needs to still be within camera. Otherwise it gets cold because of the fustrum, fulstrum. If it's not in view of the camera, the camera doesn't render it. 
that kind of calling. So if you're doing very large displacements on small objects, you may have run into some weird scenarios where that object doesn't get rendered. I encourage you to take what you've learned here today and use it to apply new cool effects with vertex manipulation. I think that's the best way to get a better understanding of the basics that we've covered today. This should be a really good foundation for you to be able to jump in and do things like applying vertex manipulations based on textures or noise. If you want to see more cool tutorials like this and maybe even applying wind to our fire cape, Make sure you've liked and subscribed to stay up to date when those videos come out. And if you want to support this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash academy, get your name up here on the screen, or just click join or super thanks right here on YouTube, get a shout out at the awesome tier, and some other cool perks too. At the awesome tier, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Rulin, Ify Obelis, and Fernando. And at the tremendous tier, there's Bruno Bozic. And at the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen. Thank you all for your support. I'm so incredibly grateful.